So hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, and so welcome to day two. Uh, we're going to be starting with module five of uh, machine learning. And as before, this presentation and all the material that we're providing today is, is uh, licensed under the Creative Commons license. So it's share and share alike concept. Uh, what we're going to be looking at today is, is hidden Markov models. And this is a subject of interest um, more for historic reasons. Uh, it's something that is frankly a very difficult subject. And I'm kind of looking forward to maybe next year where we won't really present on it. But it's been used for more than 20 years and has played a key role in a lot of um, development of bioinformatics software. And so we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll see how it can be used in sort of a limited example. Uh, and then we'll reintroduce it later on in, in the course, I think in module eight, again. The challenge with hidden Markov models is that they're mathematically really, really, really difficult to understand. There's probably about two people on the planet that understand them. And the rest of us are still struggling to figure out how they really work. So this is just an outline uh, of what we'll be doing today. We've already done our tech check, I think. Uh, everyone's got their cameras working. We'll have about uh, an hour and a quarter where we'll talk about module five, we'll have a break. Then we'll get into a very long um, lecture slash lab, which is module six. Uh, we've scheduled two hours for it. Uh, hopefully it won't be that long, but it covers a lot of things. And maybe that's the, I'll call it the highlight for the day. Uh, for others, perhaps the highlights will come around uh, 3 o'clock and 4.45 when we talk about scikit-learn, Keras, HMM-learn, and a few other tools, which make a lot of the coding and development of machine learning so much easier. Um, so that's kind of a quick outline of what we'll do today. So with module five, we're going to talk about uh, sequence motifs, because this is primarily where hidden Markov models have, have um, Sean. Uh, we'll talk about um, both uh, text um, regular expression comparisons as well as what's something called position specific scoring matrices or POSTs uh, to identify sequence motifs. Then we'll introduce the concept of Markov chains and hidden Markov models and how we can use HMMs uh, to identify sequence motifs. So then we'll go through the Python code uh, for a real HMM. And then I think most of you will soon appreciate just how difficult they are. So sequence motifs uh, are something that are identified through multiple sequence alignments. Typically, there are literally thousands of sequence motifs that have been identified, not only in protein sequences, but also in DNA sequences. And they often align to something that uh, is critical to binding, uh, to some functional aspect of a gene or a protein. This is a sequence mo uh, motif for a dead box. Uh, DEAD, it's a conserved set of four amino acids. Um, the dead box is also uh, a key signature for ATP dependent helicases. So many helicases have this. What I've indicated in, in blue below the sequence alignment is the annotation that we would use in terms of a regular expression. The uh, first residue in this 10 residue uh, motif is um, um, could either be a leucine, isoleucine, valine, or methionine. So it's the, sort of the branch chain amino acids. And there's two of them. And then there's absolute conservation of DEAD. Then the, the next residue can be just about any residue. So that's put a star in there. And then the next two residues also seem to be very hydrophobic. So this is a motif, which you can do the math, would probably match to um, you know, many po possible combinations of single sequences. Um, and this could be used to scan using regular expressions, um, any protein sequence to look for this particular conserved sequence. Um, as I said, these are found in genes and proteins, uh, binding sites, recognition sites, uh, secondary structure, tertiary structure, targeting sites. And it is through multiple sequence alignment that most um, sequence motifs have been uh, identified, whether it's in 
RNA, DNA, or protein. Uh, here's some examples of signaling uh, sites that have been identified. Um, and these can be ER directing sequence, nuclear transport signal, signal peptidase cleavage sites. And again, you can see where there's uh, different characters that are used. So a dollar sign is used to indicate the end of the sequence. Stars are used to indicate um, wild card characters or any residue. Um, curly brackets are used to help define the, the length uh, or span of, of certain residues um, between certain motifs. So all of those types of regular expressions, and depending on the library and the annotation that's used, are, are allowed. Uh, here's an example of more consistent or standard uh, regular expressions. Uh, and sort of on the left is how the regular expression appears. And then the uh, text on the right explains how uh, that is produced. So things in square brackets give you uh, the different possi possible amino acids or bases. Uh, question marks uh, indicate that could be yes or no. Um, pluses can indicate how many times it's repeated. Um, all kinds of variations on that. And certainly in the 1980s and early 1990s, uh, regular expressions were how most people um, coded or identified sequence motifs, how they talked about them in papers and journals. Um, but there are problems, and, and the fact is that um, a regular exp expression performs an exact match to a sequence. So um, maybe if uh, we had isoleucine, leucine, valine, methionine, but occasionally threonine is allowed, um, we'd have to either add a residue or we'd have to sort of, you know, allow or use some kind of scoring matrix to say, okay, this is sort of a close enough, but not, not precise. Um, if you're trying to build out sequence motifs and you have a large sequence alignment, you're spending a long time tabulating the different uh, residues or bases and counting them up and deciding whether you should include them or not include them or how many spaces or gaps should be allowed or not allowed. And it's, it's a pain because I've actually written and prepared lots of sequence motif databases when I was a student and uh, it was not fun. So. In fundamentally, sequence motifs really don't match how um, proteins or enzymes work uh, in terms of recognizing binding sites, either to DNA, RNA, or proteins themselves. Um, it is fundamentally, in biology, is, is sort of a, a fuzzy process. So what developed in the late 80s and early 90s was a concept called a, a scoring matrix or a position-specific scoring matrix. And we, we pronounce it as possum. And so there's a little picture of a baby possum on the left. Um, but it is similar to most things in bioinformatics. It's like a, a sequence uh, scoring matrix, um, whether it's the blossom matrix that you use in BLAST or the Dayhoff. Uh, matrices that are used in sequence alignments. What you do with a possum is you construct it through multiple sequence alignments. And by comparing the multiple sequence alignments, you're able to calculate the frequency of conserved bases or conserved amino acids. The conservation score in each position of the possum is converted to uh, a log odds score. It sort of converts small numbers to numbers that are sort of in the range of 0.1 to, to 1 or 2. And so what you've seen in below the picture of the possum is a, uh, a real position-specific scoring matrix spanning about 10 bases. And on the left side, you're seeing the uh, A, C, G, T. These aren't uh, frequencies. Um, originally, they were, but they're converted to a log odds score. Um, so you can see that things are, you know, between 0.1 and, and 1.2, I guess. Um, if you're given a new sequence, and that's the one that's shown in the middle, A, T, 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 A, G, T, A, T, C, you can go along the length of that possum, and um, every number that's circled represents, uh, if you want, the, the level of conservation of that sequence or agreement of that sequence to the ideal sequence. 
and by adding all the numbers up, um, you get a total score. So 0 0.2 plus 0.2 plus 0.1 plus 0.2 all the way up, you get a score of 2.5. Now it turns out rather than in um, like in bowling where the high score wins, it's more like golf uh, where the low score wins. So the low score with the possum uh, gives you your best performance. So the nice thing about possums is that it, it allows you to do fuzzy matches. Uh, you don't have to have exact matches. Um, so it's more powerful than regular expressions. It gives you a score um, to assess the quality. So just like bowling or golf, you can say whether you've done well or badly. But there is a limitation. Uh, and this has been a chronic issue for possums is that it doesn't handle insertions or deletions. So you'll look at that sequence there, that possum that I've indicated. Um, it's a defined length. Um, it's you know 10 bases long. Uh, it's not 11, it's not nine. And in fact, there isn't a really good way to describe a possum that handles insertions and deletions. So it was, I think, a realization again in the early 90s of the limitations of possums that people started to come up with other approaches to do uh, sequence motif analysis. So this led to uh, particularly the introduction of hidden Markov models. Uh, as I said, sort of at the beginning, I hate them um, because they're really hard to understand. And I think you can kind of appreciate just even looking at this picture of how difficult the hidden Markov model is. Um, it looks like there's nodes and connections and you could say it sort of looks like a neural net, uh, but it's not. And in fact, the, the, the way that the, it's diagrammed and how those connections go forward and backward is critical to the performance of a hidden Markov model. And it's technically called a probabilistic graphical model. So it means that you have to have pretty good understanding of both probability uh, of graph theory and of some fairly advanced and sophisticated mathematics. More recently, thanks to developments in the deep neural nets, most of what can be done or is being done by hidden Markov models can be done generally better and more understandably through uh, deep neural nets. So this is why I suspect this may be the last year we'll actually teach about HMMs, but from a historical perspective, HMMs are, are important. So I've mentioned that HMMs have been used for a long time, uh, particularly in speech recognition. So we talked about Alexa, Siri, and Google Home. If you've used them or tried them out, um, they do a pretty good job with speech rec recognition. They initially used HMMs. I think now most of them use deep neural nets. Uh, language translation was something, stock price prediction has been another one, musical composition, anything where there's a set of sequence or events. So music is a set of events, words, a spoken word or sentence is a set of words and events. Time series data, so if they're looking at analyzing cardiac um, monitoring, seismic data to look for patterns. Um, and in gene finding and motif finding for bioinformatics, again, viewing that a collection of sequences essentially is a, a sequential collection of letters occurring one after the other. And so this is what HMMs were initially designed for, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, HMMs initially in the world of bioinformatics were used a lot in, in prokaryotic and eukaryotic gene prediction. Um, they have been used to create sequence profiles, and there are now large collections of HMM models uh, that were used both to get sequence motifs, but also to classify sequences into families. HMMs have been used in multiple sequence alignment. Uh, they can be used in three-dimensional structure analysis, protein topology analysis. So the heyday of, of HMMs was probably through the mid nineties to I guess maybe about five or 10 years ago but they are ubiquitous in the field of bioinformatics. They are, their strengths are that they are statistical or probabilistic. So there's lots of robust math associated with them. It, as you'll find out, allows you to come up with a pretty systematic, uh, mathematically robust approach to estimating parameters and to calculating probabilities. Uh, it's an iterative process for improving probabilities. 
So when we calculate probabilities by hand, typically we measure a whole bunch of events. There might be conditional probabilities. And so we'll collect all of that information, run numbers through it, and then we come up with estimates. Hidden Markov models use things like expectation maximization um, methods to help actually improve those probability estimates. Um, the strength primarily, at least as an example we're going to use today and look at, is with sequence motifs and dealing with insertions and gaps. And as I said, you know, with regard to things like regular expressions or more specifically to possums, um, that's, a, that's a weakness. They can't handle insertions and deletions, whereas hidden Markov models can. Um, so my point at the bottom is that hidden Markov models are really, really difficult to understand. So I'm not expecting any of you, unless you have studying, been studying hidden Markov models for the last two or three years, to understand all of the material I'm going to present today. Um, but I'd like you at least to get a, a general appreciation of what's, what's done, um, in part because some of the concepts from hidden Markov models have, have made their way into um, even the theory for neural nets. So Markov models uh, are different than hidden Markov models. Markov models are essentially a set of events or sequential events. Um, essentially, a Markov model is something that depends only on the previous event. So, um, you know, if you're going down a pathway and there's multiple forks in the pathway, um, where you end up is, is essentially a function of what, what you did in terms of choosing one or two directions. So it's a little bit like the path uh, decision-making in, in terms of a uh, decision tree. There's an interesting historical bit of trivia here, which is that Markov models were actually used to create the very first uh, sequence scoring matrices. Uh, that was called the point, I guess the point assisted mutation matrix or PAM matrix that Margaret Dayhoff, who's the founder of bioinformatics, uh, developed in the 1960s. Um, and so what she did was uh, she calculated essentially a, a scoring matrix for very, very similar sequences. And that scoring matrix was called the PAM one matrix, uh, an assumption where there's just small mutations small numbers, very closely at line sequences. And that roughly correspond to about 1 million years of evolution. At least that was her estimate. By multiplying the, multiplying the PAM1 matrix 250 times, so that's one after the other after the other, so this is matrix multiplication, she produced the PAM250 matrix, which corresponded to the expected evolution of sequences over 250 million years. Um, Again, to produce it, you had to do a um, multiplication in sequence. And so this was essentially a Markov process where one million years of mutation times another million years of mutation produces the PAM2 matrix. It was all theoretical, but what she ended up producing actually was a scoring matrix that was amazingly useful. It was useful for more than 20 years in terms of sequence comparison alignments. And it was only improved on slightly uh, through the development of the Blossom matrix. So a Markov model, as I say, it's a set of sequences. Um, and, and typically, they are connected by arrows, or in some cases, um, multiplication events. So the arrow represents the probability of transition. So the probability of A to B, or from B to C. Um, so the probability of B uh, coming from A is equal to the probability uh, of the, the state being B and the state, the previous state being A. Uh, in this case, B can only come from A. And so uh, the current state depends on the previous state's transition probability. If that transition probability is zero, then obviously B cannot come from A and therefore C cannot come from B. So that, as I say, is, is the Markov model. Um, there are different types of Markov chains. 
uh, if we have the, the simplest one, which is only the preceding event or preceding base or preceding amino acid um, determines what's going to follow, that's a first order Markov. Um, a second order Markov chain depends on having um, or is dependent on two other preceding events. So in the sequence that's given in the middle, um, you need A and T to contribute to the occurrence of G. Uh, you need T and G to contribute to the occurrence of C. Now, a Markov chain becomes a hidden Markov chain when we have the observable sequences, A, T, G, C, A, T, A, A there, but then we have these other boxes, uh, which are hidden effects or hidden observations that influence things. Um, so it's, it's sort of the, the puppeteer behind the curtain or um, the sound effects from, uh, again, the hidden black curtain that influence those sequences. So we know that amino acid sequences are not, uh, or even base sequences, are not entirely influenced by the preceding base. Um, they're influenced by other effects. Um, and similarly, in terms of deciding, and so there's uh, the, the invisible hand of evolution that is guiding that. And so to some extent, that's what these hidden observation or hidden effects have to do. Um, we are typically, when we're talking about hidden Markov models or Markov models, we're working in the field of conditional probability. Uh, so the probability in terms of a first order Markov model of seeing the sequence ACT GTC is just simply the probability of A uh, times the probability of C times the probability of T and so on. The second order um, Markov model of seeing the same sequence would say that the probability of ACT GTC is equal to the probability of A times the probability of C given A times the probability of t given c. Um, and then a third order would be um, what's shown there, where we've got p, p c given a, p of c given a, probability of t given a and c, and so on. Um, so again, if you know a little bit of probability, um, you can see where it can get a little complicated, that it starts including, including uh, Bayesian types of models. If we wanted to look at a, a true, uh, and this is a, a somewhat simpler architecture for a hidden Markov model, we talk about topologies. Um, and this is where the term graphical model, so hidden Markov models always begin with a, a graph or a picture. And there are certain conventions in how these pictures have to be drawn. So in the case of sequences, um, circles are used to indicate where there are deletions. Uh, diamonds are used to indicate where there are insertions. Uh, squares are used to indicate um, if you want the sequence. Uh, it is structured like a network, so there are arrows with directions. Um, some from any given node, there might be two or three or four different arrows coming in and coming out. There can also be self arrows, so something leaving and then coming back in, so those rounded arrows. And um, within uh, the arrows, um, what we would call in neural nets, the weightings, these are called transition probabilities. And those are the edges in this network. And then the squares, diamonds, and circles, um, they have certain probabilities as well. And those are written in the numbers there. Those are called emission probabilities. So the arrows have numbers, uh, and those are assigned values between zero and one. And the squares, diamonds, and circles have probabilities. Um, so we have different layers, different states, uh, numbers within uh, the nodes, and numbers on the arrows for the nodes. Um, and this, this topology here is a typical one that's used to handle sequence motifs. Uh, because it allows for matching sequences, that's the match state, it allows for insertions and deletions. So we're going to take an example of, of a hidden Markov model, um, where we're beginning essentially from a sequence alignment. 
So we have five sequences here, and it's a very short kind of meaningless motif, but it's at least simple to calculate. What we're showing here are um, sort of modestly conserved um, set of residues and maybe the second and maybe the set of A's at the where the gap is. But what we've got are um, gaps or insertions here. Um, and what I've written below is a regular expression, which would explain this motif. Um, and if you do the math, um, this motif would have about 3,600 possible valid sequences, uh, which is a huge number and probably is not terribly useful in terms of uh, defining a sequence motif. And the fact that there's um, this inclusion of gaps and other challenges with the regular expression makes the regular expression kind of useless. And what it would suggest is that a hidden Markov model would be better. So we're going to use this multiple sequence alignments to help, help build it out. What we do is um, we start calculating the frequency of, um, from the multiple alignment, the number of A's and T's um, in, in the sequence. So we go column by column in this case. And so the first column, we can see that there's four A's and one T. So we can convert that to a probability. Four out of five is 0.8, one out of five is 0.2. We can do that for the second column. Uh, we get a probability of G and C, a probability of A and C. Then it gets messy um, because now we're dealing with insertions. And so we can go column by column, um, identifying the occurrence of um, essentially insertions and no insertions. So where we have a delta, uh, we have in column, I guess it's four, column five, column six, uh, we have inserts. And so the calculation is done there. We've got a number of sequences that have inserts is 0.6. The number of sequences that don't have insertions is two out of five. And then column by column, we can see the probability of A's and C's and T's and G's are also given. So that's the messy part where we're dealing with the insertion. And then we go to the uh, seventh column. We can see it's all A's, so the probability of A is one, and so on with um, the seventh and eighth and ninth columns. So this is how we get some initial statistics. Um, now we have to uh, generate a model. And if you recall that, um, uh, diamonds uh, are used for insertions, circles are for deletions, and squares are used for, for matches. So we have to now draw out a graph, this is the graphical model, for that um, sequence alignment, which is shown in the corner there with the, sort of the screenshot. And this is the graph that would explain or best explain um, the model through a hidden Markov approach. So we can see A and T, we can write in terms of um, the emission probabilities uh, in the squares, it's 0.8 and 0.2. Um, we have a transition probability of one going to the second column. We have a position, uh, transition probability of one going to the third column. But then as we get to the fourth, fifth and sixth columns, uh, we have this, um, um, probability for uh, essentially insertions. And so this is where we fill in the diamond with all the probabilities for A, T's and G's and C's. We also fill in the diamond for um, both uh, transitions uh, to the insertions and um, also for the occurrence of um, the first, um, first base of what we would want to see, I guess, so you can see the transition and emission probabilities, uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, uh, another 0 0.4. Uh, those are all taken from the calculations that we have um, on that little diagram in the corner. And then we get back to the squares, uh, which now corresponds to column uh, seven. And we can see A has a probability of one, so that's the 
emission probability, transition probability of one, and so on. So with that model, um, there's a path that we can follow. And so if we're given a sequence, and let's say the sequence is AC, AC, uh, dash, dash, ATC, we can uh, essentially calculate the probability of its occurrence by taking the transition and emission probabilities and multiplying them all the way through. So it's, it's an exercise in multiplication, you know, 0.8 times 1 times 0.8 times 1. And again, we're looking at the sequence and we're using the emission uh, probabilities that are in each of the squares or the diamonds to come up with a value. Mm -hmm. So we do all the multiplication and we end up with a score of 0 0.047. We can convert that rather small number to a log odds ratio um, or LOD and we can use the formula here, which allows us to convert um, those numbers um, or those probabilities and correct, correct for both the frequency of bases. So there's four bases, so a 0.25 is used for DNA. There's 20 amino acids, so one out of 20, 0.05 is the probability um, for any given amino acid. And so this is the, the, the formula for log conversion. So we can convert that now to log odds values. And I've put those in. And once we've converted to log odds, uh, instead of doing multiplications, we can do additions. So the same graphical model, um, the same set that we saw here has again been converted to log odds. And you can see the numbers are different, but, uh, and that we simply, we add them all up. So and get a, instead of getting something at 0 0.047, we now get a score of 6.67 when we do our trace through uh, with pr this particular sequence. So the point is that with this hidden Markov model, this graphical probabilistic model, we can calculate um, scores uh, for sequences and say, how good is this sequence? Uh, how well does it match to my sequence motif? Is it a high scoring sequence motif? Is it a low scoring sequence motif? Um, and, and, and should it be uh, you know, considered as a real one? And so now it's better than the possum because we're able to handle gaps in both insertions and deletions. And we're also able to handle um, the appearance of um, matching bases or uh, amino acids. So we can take in a whole bunch. Here's you know, seven or eight different sequences. And we want to see whether any of these approximate that motif that we are postulating on. So you know, I've, I've put in a bunch of sequences. I've calculated both through multiplication um, and through um, um, the log odds calculations. And what we find out is that um, there's one that has a very high log odds score. Um, and that one's a very good match to our motif. And then there's one in red, which has a very low log odds score. And that's one obviously that shouldn't be included. And then there are others that are hovering around 4.6 to 5.3. And depending on what you've chosen as your threshold or your cutoff, you could say, well, these are also probably legitimate motifs. So um, what we're doing in a hidden Markov model, and as I say, this is a very simple one. Um, we had a very small number of sequences. Um, and so at some level, we could evaluate it. Um, if, and if this is a real example, one where we were trying to actually have legitimate motif, um, trying to create a motif out of five sequences, something you shouldn't do. Um, there's a trick called pseudo counting, uh, which has been first developed for possums, but allows you to sort of fill in extra information so that you're, um, and essentially these are dummy variables. But that's another thing that you could have done with this HMM. Um, so there's an evaluation problem and when you're doing hidden Markovs. That's where I was doing all the additions and multiplications and where I had to follow a path. Um, there's um, this determining which sequence to follow or set of events to follow um, 
again, because it's simple for us, it's like a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a path, but we could have gone one, two, three, and then I could have gone here. I could have gone up here and gone around a few times and then down here. Those are paths. And when you are determining a path in a sequence, you use dynamic programming. And some of you may have heard of dynamic programming. It's always used in sequence alignment. It's a pathfinding algorithm. And uh, there's the Needleman-Wunsch pathfinding algorithm. There's also the Viterbi uh, pathfinding algorithm. So in hidden Markov models, we use the Viterbi instead of the Needleman-Wunsch algorithm for dynamic programming. That's called uh, a decoding problem. So there's an evaluation problem, a decoding problem. Um, in, in situations where you don't have an alignment, um, and, and this is more frequent in uh, not only sequence motifs, but in general for most hidden Markov models, um, you can learn the transition and emission probabilities. So in our case, because we had an alignment, we could calculate the emission and transition probabilities. But if you don't have an alignment, um, you, you can have a learning algorithm. Uh, it's called the Baum-Welsh algorithm uh, to estimate the emission and transition probabilities. And so that's the learning problem. So in HMMs, um, you have to solve three problems, the evaluation problem, the decoding problem, and if you don't have alignment information, you also have to solve the learning problem. Um, so this is summarized here. Um, so if we're evaluating, given the model parameters, calculate the probability of a particular sequence. And you saw how I did that for some simple sequences back here. I just did some log odds or simple multiplications. But while it seemed simple, I still had to essentially follow a path and, and determine what those numbers are. Um, there's this decoding one, which is, in fact, how did I find the path? Um, and how did I get those um, both include the certain hidden states, the, the circles and the diamonds uh, in my calculation. And the learning problem, I didn't have to do that in the example I gave you. Um, but if I just had the simple observations, then I would have had to have estimated the emission and transition probabilities. So we're going to take an example which is more complicated than the simple one I just gave, uh, where we're going to try and essentially solve or address all three problems, uh, which is pretty standard for most hidden Markov models. Now, to do um, evaluation, um, typically um, we use a technique called the forward algorithm. So it's, it's um, a path tracing algorithm. So it's a form of dynamic programming. Um, in the example I gave you, it wasn't a very challenging dynamic programming one. It was just you know, follow the, the obvious path. So there's something that we'll, we'll call the forward algorithm. You'll see that a little later. Then the decoding problem, um, that's another dynamic programming algorithm. It's to find the most likely sequence of hidden states that results in the observed set of events. So it's how do I include the um, insertions and deletions, the diamonds and the circles, which, which path do I follow? Um, and it is essential for uh, HMMs involving sequence profiles. So they hear the word Viterbi a lot when people talk about sequence uh, motifs. Um, the one that's probably more interesting, at least, at least as it pertains to machine learning, um, is um, a forward-backward algorithm. This is also what's called the Baum-Welsh. And it uses a technique called expectation maximization. So it's an optimization algorithm at some level. Um, and it allows you to, to estimate the transition and emission probabilities uh, without having, uh, in this case, sequence alignments. It iterates, it estimates the probabilities, and then uh, refines them. And so in that regard, the Baum-Walsh algorithm, you could say, is, is an analog to, um, say, the backpropagation um, elements that we saw in neural networks. Uh, it just it optimizes things and it you know, calculates error, goes back, 
adjust things, calculate the error. Um, and just like in neural nets, you have this idea of going forward, backward, forward, backward. And that's why Bob Welsh is called a forward backward algorithm. Okay, so hopefully I haven't lost too many of you, but as I say, uh, hidden Markov models are, are really complicated and, and I have no expectation of, of anyone really um, knowing the innards of, of hidden Markov models after this. But we're gonna try it or show how it would be used um, in bacterial DNA sequence. So we've chosen bacterial DNA because bacteria have simple gene structures um, simple promoter structures. Eukaryotic um, gene structure is really, really complicated. And, and certainly there have been very good successes with eukaryotic gene analysis using hidden Markov models, but they get incredibly sophisticated and are really complicated. So we're not going to try and go from zero to 60 here. So just for people who don't know, or as a reminder for people who've forgotten, um, promoters are sections of DNA located typically on the uh, five prime or in the front of genes uh, that promote um, the binding of other proteins uh, to enhance um, transcription. Typically, you'll find promoters um, anywhere from 30 to 200 base pairs in front of the translation start codon. Um, so they're not immediately in front, they're kind of a little further down. They're typically associated with um, operons, so you don't find promoters for every single gene. You'll find promoters maybe for gene clusters. Um, so I've illustrated there again the sequence, ATG is the typical start codon, the promoter is some random sequence up there. Um, in particular, there's uh, one site that's called the, the Prigno box, uh, which is one that's used for transcription initiation. And you know, sequence alignments and sequence comparisons have identified this uh, RNA polymerase site that has a modestly conserved TTGAC in the minus 35 site, and then a TATA, T-A-T-A-A-T sequence, um, a few bases. Um, downstream from that, about 20 bases or so. Um, this is not um, you know, 35 bases upstream of the ATG site. It's just um, could be anywhere uh, up to 200 bases away. But this is uh, characteristic of called the Pribno box. So we're going to be looking for promoter-like sequences um, similar to the Pribno box. And what you saw with the sequence there is it's sort of a sequence motif. Um, the conservation, again, is uh, lower cases indicates this, it's not well conserved. Uppercase A, these are well conserved, but this is not um, a great um, sequence in the sense of it's not a regular expression and it uh, doesn't allow fuzzy matches, doesn't really handle gaps because the gaps can be variable. So this is a, a sequence that's just ripe for doing um, hidden Markov models. So um, this is the workflow we've talked about in the past. Uh, it's sort of how do I define um, um, or how do I generate a motif from unaligned sequence data? Um, so we define our problem. Uh, what we're going to do is looking at promoter sequences. Um, that have been collected uh, and to identify this Pribno box. So here's a mess of sequences um, and we wanna run our hidden Markov model through that. And we wanna be able to see that TTGAC and TATA link with certain variable um, gaps in between. So we wanna see if our hidden Markov model can pick out um, those promoters and uh, conserved elements within the promoter sequence. So what we're gonna do is, is take a set of about 50 bases. Um, we're gonna develop a hidden Markov model uh, with uh, the 50, a total of 50 hidden states. Um, and we're gonna train them on a set of sequences. We're gonna determine the emission and transition probabilities um, from this set of unaligned sequences using the, the Baum-Welsh algorithm. So that's our plan. Uh, we'll see if we can do that. So from our plan, 
we have to get our data set. So there is a, a large collection of E. coli promoter sequences, a total of about 1,800 promoter sequences where there's a known transcription start site. Um, and these ones are all collected uh, to span about 50 um, bases before the transcription start site. Um, now, these are not aligned. Um, so we, we aren't attempting to find the, the Pribno box through alignments. We're just simply saying, here's, here's a mess of sequences. Here's 1,800 of them. Let's use the bomb welsh algorithm to figure out where the, the patterns are. Now, the other point is that within E. coli, um, there's about 4,500 genes. Um, so promoters, on average, there's one promoter for every three genes. And that's just a characteristic of many bacteria because they have uh, operons where they just need one promoter maybe for three or four genes uh, that, are, that are run off in the operon. Okay, so we're going to try programming our hidden Markov model. Um, if we were to do this, we'd you know, go to our collab file. In, in our case, obviously we're not expecting you to write this, but we've already written it for you both in the Python and in R. Um, it's um, given the title HMM motif, and so you can open it up. And the general algorithm we're going to follow um, is, is outlined here. Um, just like with all the other programs, we're going to read our data. Uh, we're going to do some encoding. Uh, it's not one hot encoding, but we are encoding the sequence data. We're going to initialize our HMM. Uh, we're going to write our forward algorithm for the bomb welch we're going to write the backward algorithm for bomb welch so forward backward is another name for bomb welch and then we're going to combine the two um, to create the bomb welch function and then we're going to write the viterbi function so this is the dynamic programming uh, function that i talked about then we're going to initialize and train the hidden markov model by calling uh, uh, the two algorithms, HMM initializing and bomb welsh um, And then we're going to create the log probability functions. That's the, um, if you want, the log D if we want, uh, or log odds. And then we're going to use uh, the Viterbi algorithm again to do the evaluation, refine those log probability measures. And then we're going to evaluate the performance of our uh, motifs um, in terms of detecting or correctly detecting the promoters. So it's a fairly complicated algorithm uh, and we'll, again, probably don't have time, in fact, we do, don't have time to, to go into a lot of the details. But with most uh, things that we've seen in machine learning, we call up NumPy and Pandas. Uh, we have the data set reading, so we have our motif sequences in a comma-separated file format. Um, they're structured in a certain way. We're using a drop NA um, uh, function to help clean up some of the data. Um, we're looking for um, any, uh, well, we're also looking for the reverse uh, sequences as well as the forward ones. So we've read in our data set. Um, we're going to now transform our features. So in this case, we're converting A, T, C, and G into numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3 here. So this is a form of encoding to help simplify things. Uh, again, we're working with the forward sequence uh, as well as the reverse sequence. Um, we've chosen to solve this using an HMM. As I said, um, in the future, uh, we're probably going to be using um, recurrent neural nets uh, or LSTM models. But historically, this is how people would do HMMs or use them. So we're going to initialize our, our parameters. Um, we're going to initialize the transition probabilities. We're going to initialize the emission probabilities. And we're going to initialize the initial state probabilities. And so basically, we're calling random numbers to put in random start points. Um, and this, as I say, is what you do when you don't have an alignment. Um, you're letting uh, the bomb Welsh do your work for you. And you can see various functions like random or random.rand um, that help create those initial random distributions. So now we uh, encode the forward algorithm. Um, 
And Baumol fuses both forward and backward. So the forward algorithm is defined um, here. I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, it's pretty complicated math, but that's what it looks like. Um, it calculates the current state to turn the probability of the next state. So this is where the Markov concept comes in. Um, we have visible states. Um, those are the, if you want to call them the match states, uh, which are the, the, the squares. Um, and um, we're then going to calculate um, the probability that the Markov model will be in a particular state at a particular step. Um, so this is um, essentially the optimization equivalent to uh, the back propagation that we talked about in neural nets. It's fairly costly in terms of calculations. Uh, it goes as the order n squared. Then there's the backward algorithm, which is the other half of the um, the Turby, or rather the von Welsh. So consider this the equivalent to back propagation, like we had in neural nets. Um, and it's used to calculate the probability of observations given the hidden states. So we've initialized HMM, we've generated the forward algorithm, we've generated the backward algorithm. So then you have to combine the two to create the forward slash backward algorithm, uh, which is essentially the, the learning algorithm. So what this is doing is it's calling, so this is the Baum-Welsh function, we're creating that, but then here's where we're calculating the forward-backward, those are the calls that we're making here, and then there's some normalization, some dot products that are also calculated through the, um, the matrices that we're, we're building out. That carries on, um, again, fairly complicated math, and we're not expecting anyone to, to understand that. But in the end, we create our transition and emission probabilities. Um, so these are tables of transition emission probabilities for this particular um, um, hidden Markov model. So that's the learning part. And as I say, think of it as being equivalent to the back propagation algorithm, uh, but we call it the von Welsh function. Then we have to create the Viterbi function, which does the dynamic programming. Um, so this is, um, it's used in, as we call it, the decoding, also in the evaluation. Um, and again, fairly complicated math. Uh, lots of probabilities determined through it. Uh, it's not a short program. Uh, it's calculating various maximum values. It's doing some um, essentially what most dynamic programming algorithms do, which is this traceback um, step to, to find the, the best path. So this is um, the Viterbi algorithm. Again, we're not going to go into details, but just trust me that it is a dynamic programming algorithm. So we've built out all the functions uh, that are key for hidden Markov models. Now we can actually start putting the hidden Markov model together. So we've, we've built the base. Uh, now we can put on the icing. So um, we start off with initializing. Um, and essentially, we have um, the uh, initializing function that we could create it. That's called here the Baum Welsh function. These are highlighted sort of in blue just to show you that we're calling them. Um, and this is where we're essentially training. So we start off with these random set of um, probabilities. Then we um, go through this iterative training with the Baum Welsh. And the result is um, these are the, the probabilities that essentially uh, come out from, from that training. Um, so these are um, state to state transitions. Um, so there's uh, essentially a seven by seven matrix. And then there's the emission probabilities. Uh, that's a four by seven matrix uh, for the different bases that we're talking about. Um, the initial probabilities, uh, an array of seven numbers. From that um, calculation of the transition emission initial uh, probabilities, then we have to call the, the Turby dynamic programming 
uh, algorithm um, to calculate the log probabilities. And so this function calculates the log probabilities uh, and it also has a, a cutoff to sort of draw the line. And through running that Returby program, uh, we can test our sequences. We can look at the 1800 promoter sequences along, along with thousands of other non-promoter sequences that we also had. And then we we have a cutoff that essentially says, is this, um, is this a sequence that's a promoter or does it fa fit the promoter probability or does it not? And that's, if you recall how we were doing our log odds evaluation where we either multiplied or added and we said, is this above or this below some kind of cutoff? Will we accept it as a, as a member of our motif or not? So this again is using the similar sort of thing is there a cutoff? Um, is it a member of the promoter motif or the Privno box uh, motif or not? So a lot of work, really complicated. Um, and this is the result. Uh, so again, we've got you know, 1800 promoter sequences and thousands of other non-promoter sequences. The confusion matrix is shown on the right. And recall that a good confusion matrix along the diagonal for prediction matching observed should be something on the order of 0.9 and 0.9. Um, instead, we're getting 0.2 and 0.7, and that our often diagonals are 0.8 and 0.3. So in some respects, this hidden Markov model is a failure. <laughs> um, and it just underlines how complicated they are, and the fact that we were sort of naive in taking just the first 50 bases. Um, because it turns out that some of the promoter motifs um, are outside of that 50 base scan. So at some level, um, it's a lot of work for nothing, um, but at least the diagonal is not all zeros. So it is picking up promoter sequences and it highlights the fact that promoter sequences are actually pretty noisy. Um, that the conservation of the Pridno box is actually quite poor. Um, and that the position of the Pridna box actually varies tremendously, um, uh, more from the zero to 50. It also highlights some of the weaknesses, I think, of hidden Markov models, uh, which is A, as you've seen from the code, they're really complicated. Uh, and B, we didn't do sufficient feature engineering in this particular example um, to, to really build on what's known or some of the other components um, or a smarter way of assembling the data or um, compiling the data so that we, we get a slightly better performance. So um, I guess what I basically say is that we have a, an algorithm that sort of works. Uh, it's a correct hidden Markov model. Um, it doesn't crash, but because we hadn't been careful in assembling our data, and putting in a sufficient number of features, uh, the performance is not great. Um, through this, we can still create um, sequence motifs with this trained hidden Markov model. And so there's additional code in the program to, to actually perform that and to propose a minus 10 box and a minus 35 box uh, from a particular um, sequence. So overall, it's a, a, it's a big program, uh, hundreds of lines long. It takes a long time to train. It takes a fair bit of time to run. Um, we've also written the program in R um, and uh, the performance in R and in Python is about the same. R is a little faster, uh, but the R code is a little longer. Uh, in R, it's pure R, so we aren't using any uh, extra functions like uh, matrix uh, or data reading tools like NumPy and Pandas. So whether it's in pure Python or pure R, uh, we've had a, a hidden Markov model. Um, it, the performance isn't great. We think there's still possibly a bug in the code, uh, which is why it's not doing perfectly, but uh, we've never been able to find the bug in the last year. Um, so maybe that's just the, the actual performance. It is possible to use uh, this structure, the hidden Markov model structure, where we've got the bomb Walsh, we've got the, the Turby algorithm, so that you could potentially apply it to more sophisticated things. 
but you'd really have to understand the code. And as I say, very few people really truly understand hidden Markov models. So we also, as I say, have the R code. And if you're more comfortable in R, you can run that. 